The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IA exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This episode is brought to you by NetWealth, market-leading providers of technology, excellent customer support and expertise to help your wealth business thrive. Rated number one for overall satisfaction and value for money by Investment Trends and Chant West's Advised Product of the Year for the last four years, NetWealth is here to support you on your advice technology journey. See wealth differently and visit the website to learn how NetWealth can support your advice and wealth business. Hello and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and joining me here today to deep dive into the fourth line software is... Well, previously a financial advisor, an escaped corporate captive in his own words, and sometimes known as the Fazia guy. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Joel Ronke. Woo! Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Now, very keen to dive in and get to understand all things fourth line. But let's just sort of get you get to know you a little better through your use of technology. Yes. What's your most used emoji? Do you use emojis? Uh, I'm not. I'm not a big emoji user, but I've found lately the thumbs up's getting a lot, um, okay. just because it's nice and you know easy and um, positive, uh, yep. and also obviously the smiley face one as well. But um, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, not a, I'm not a big emoji user, but they're the two ones I use most. Yeah, okay, very good. And if you had to delete all of the apps off your smartphone, and we all now have so many, it's ridiculous, isn't it? But you yes. could only keep three. What three would you keep? Yep, no dramas. I would keep Notion, which I've recently discovered, um, okay. which is a great little uh, kind of thought collecting um, um, uh, app, which yep. that's really, um, I'm actually using it to build out thoughts and um, program structures and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the other one is Audible. So mm-hmm. I do a, lot of, um, do a lot of running and stuff. So that keeps me going through my runs. So Audible yep. is a really, really good one. Um, and Strava is the, is the last one. So yeah, okay. just to make sure I'm keeping up with my mates and beating their times and all that kind of stuff, I keep <laughs> Strava as well. Healthy competition. I love it. That's I it. Love it. That's exactly right. It's interesting. Things like Notion, I think um, you're probably like me. One of the hardest things is that ideas don't come in a flurry, do they? They come randomly throughout the day. They can be out Correct. when you're socializing. And Correct. I mean, the what previously before something like Notion, you'd what email yourself or something idiotic like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to yeah. collate them all, right? That's right. That's right. I, it often yeah. comes to me when I'm running. And, and before Notion, I'd have to keep repeating to myself the thought just I until know. I got home and then I could write it down. But now I kind of stop and I put it into Notion and I keep going. It's good. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a sanity saver. I love yes. it. Yes. All righty. So, Let's dive into fourth line. So just to give us a broad sense, let's go a bit high level initially. Yep. In terms of where fourth line sits in the advice tech world, now my understanding, it broadly sits in reg, reg tech, yes. right? That's the category. Yes. But sort of what area does it specifically cover? Well, it's specifically looking at the uh, advice creation part of the advisor process or advisor yep. engagement with, with the clients. Um, so really what we're looking at is the the, uh, the methodology that the client, sorry, that the advisors followed to get to the SOA, the statement of advice now. So okay. it's not just looking at the SOA, it's also looking at the key documentation and processes followed to get there. Yeah, okay, fantastic. And I guess that's probably come about because there aren't many solutions that look at things that way, right? There's, I mean, it feels like there's not a lot of competitors for you guys in this sort of this sort of space. 
Yeah, true. It's true. It's only, there's only like maybe a, a couple. Um, yep. You know, there's obviously Sammy, which is pretty well known. Um, Tick was, um, you know, re- is reasonably now well known as more so maybe a couple of years ago. Um, but I suppose most of our direct competition, when I speak to licensees and advisors in particular, um, is really compliance consultants. So, yeah, okay. you know, those individual compliance consultants, which is there's a lot of them now. You can see them on LinkedIn. They're really good. Um, and um, the the challenge that with that um, that the, some of the compliance consultants face versus the forefront solution is obviously compliance consultants do it really well. They've got their checklist to follow, but they've got capacity constraints. Yeah. Uh, and often the um, the the pricing structure is slightly um, you know fourth line is a lot more affordable than than a, a compliance consultant often. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, so it's a, it's an interesting space because often people often ask me who's your competitor or who are your competitors, and yeah, it's really direct compliance consultants and and maybe Sammy and, and Tick to a lesser degree. Yeah, okay. And I guess that part of the other challenges with any time you have a consultant, really on anything, is something that whatever you're working on stops because it goes away to the consultant and then it comes back and then the process continues. And I'm betting just having a look look at what's behind uh, Fourth Line, then that's less likely. This is sort of living and breathing feedback as opposed to stop, submit, wait, return. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, correct, correct. You know, so so, um, advisors will have their advice back to them within the next business day. So if, if right, they've okay. submitted through the fourth line platform, um, then the report's generated within the next business day. It goes out. Okay. Well, so a couple of things uh, caught my eye when I did some digging to understand better for myself. Yeah. You've got a partnership with Swin, Swinburne University of Technology. Now, yep. the notes sort of talked about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in in the nature of what we're talking about here, how does that play out? Where's the value from that? Yeah, so so at the moment, so that's really going towards our second generation product and what we're building out. So so um, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, natural language processing. That's all part of the the things that we're building out at the moment behind the scenes within the platform. So it obviously takes time, and, and Swinburne's a, a key partner in that. We've also got Mills Oakley on the on the kind of law side of things. Yeah, um, that helps us kind of as we're building that kind of stuff out as well. Yeah, okay. And so that's the sort of element that's about this bionic approach is trying to, you know, sort of had the human. Yeah, Yeah, and I think that's what differentiates us a little bit from, um, you know, the compliance consultants and also the SAMI is that we're kind of in the middle and that we've got a bit of both. Okay. Um, we've got the human oversight, the, the, the human engagement factor as well as the technology factor. All right. So then this is likely to be used, um, from what I'm hearing, both at a licensee level and an inv- individual advisor level. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Like, so when, when we when we first started around three years ago, um, and and still today, you know, our core, um, you know, our core user are licensees. So anything from we've got, you know, two AR licensee all the way up to a, over five hundred AR licensee, and then, then anything in between, and that's been our traditional market, and then. I think, you know, over the last probably six to uh, this year, probably six to nine months this year, we've seen a lot more practices come and approach us directly okay. and say, hey, we've heard about you, um, you know, we want to get ahead of the game. It might be that um, they're not feeling the love from their licensee. It might be that they're growing and they want to make sure they've got oversight over their, their advisors internally. But, yeah, some, some practices are starting to reach out now directly to us and say, hey, can you help us irrespective of what our licensee is doing? Okay. And so then in terms of the user experience, um, then, you know, how does that, once they've sort of been onboarded into fourth line, then what does that, how does that take part, you know, how do they take part in that? What, What experience do they have? Yeah, so so with with Forthline, uh, it's really up to so the beauty of the platform is it's up to the licensee and all the practice um, to determine how they want to want to use Forthline. Now, I think um, since breach reporting came in last year in October last year, we've seen a real um, move towards pre vetting. So trying mm-hmm. to, to as much as possible, you know, it depends on scale of the business and what's going on behind the scenes in, at the licensee level, but trying to put through as much of the advice. Um, through a pre-vet scenario before it goes out the door so that they can identify issues, fix the issues, and then send out the SOA to the client because, as we all know, 
the breach a breach doesn't become a breach until it's been uh, delivered to the client. Yeah, uh, and that's where we're getting a lot of lot of traction and action in fourth line is around the pre vetting space. Yeah, okay. And I mean, anybody who histor- historically who's been through a licensee pre vet just by joining a new one, I mean, you could be talking a month turnaround for documents, you know, for review. So, <laughs> I mean, anything better than that sounds like yes. it's a win for, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. for oh, both the absolutely. advisor and the client. Yeah. And um, and the other uh, other area, especially in, in kind of this year with so much movement going on across the industry, um, a lot of licensees are using fourth line for due diligence purposes. So okay. um, they're looking at, so let's say an advisor approaches a licensee or a practice approaches a licensee, the licensee might say, right, well, we want to put 20, 30, 40, 50 uh, SOAs and supporting documents through fourth line so that we can see if there's any issues. Uh, and that's that's really powerful and really and something that's uh, you know completely scalable. Uh, time turnarounds really quick, and it allows the licensee to, to then make an informed decision about whether they want to bring on that practice, that advisor, or not. And so, when in that process, then when is you know what's done by the technology versus what's done by the humans? You know, what part is this getting slicker, and what part gives that real personalization that can that can be necessary? Yeah, so so the, the the technology is kind of drawing out the information from from the documentation that's uploaded into the, okay. the fourth line system, and the, and the human oversight is making sure that uh, the technology is working properly, that there's no false positives or false negatives, uh, and also um, the the human oversight also caters for the fact that each client's an individual and mm-hmm. each piece of advice is is unique. You know, there's certain strategies and all that kind of stuff that we all use as advisors, but mm-hmm. each each SOA is unique, and they're also the process that's followed by the by the uh, by the advisor. So the human oversight also allows um, us to d- dig into that. Uh, advice process that's followed by the advisor. So, you know, looking at um, the file notes in a little bit more detail or it might be any unique um, uh, documentation that the advisor's uploaded into the system or the licensee uploaded into the system that can then be used to evaluate that particular case, that particular SOA. And as a result of that evaluation, uh, the fourth line system then generates a, um, a, a a report. It's also, it's, a, it's almost like an exceptions report mm-hmm. where uh, out of the, in the report, it, it lists basically um, the flags, the, the, the risk flags, if you like, that have been identified, adds commentary around those particular flags, and also then has um, the associated legislation or a regulatory guide reference that ties to that flag. For that's really powerful. As, yeah. yeah, and that, that's really powerful because it allows the, the licensee, so now we're talking about the human at the licensee side, it then allows, you know, your your compliance coach or your quality advice coach or whatever, whatever's uh, behind the scenes of the licensee to then take that report, use that information and work collaboratively with the advisor rather than it be a you know a punitive kind of naughty naughty approach it's actually well here's the issue here's why it's an issue because here's the regulations or the rg or whatever it might be um here's where it's the issue is in the soa or the the supporting documentation all right let's let's work out why that's the case and then they use it as a bit of a coaching tool and we've had many licensees over over the years kind of say to us you know that they now enjoy using fourth line whereas in the past it used to be i remember one guy said to me you know i used to go out and um to to the to the practices and and in one case he almost got into a physical alteration with the uh <laughs> with the advisor because the advisor go you're picking on me and he's going no i'm yeah. not and yeah. you know because they had their internal checklist whereas now it's kind of a collaborative conversation there's an inter the independent third party which is fourth line saying here are the issues here are why they're issues here is the location of the issues within your advice and now the advisor go ah oh, okay i get it you're not you're not actually having a go at me you're actually trying to help me improve the way i i provide my advice and that's a that's a key outcome of fourth line is it's not it's not just about the the advice or the advice process it's about helping advisors improve and um, change their behavior if needed and or allow the licensee to amend the template of the SOA if it's not right. quite up to scratch. Right. And I think um, what I like about that too is, is like you say, having been, of course, on the other side of that with as an advisor, then they can historically, and we're talking years ago now, but historically there could be a lot of just no 
no, can't do that. Well, well, that's not helpful because I don't know why I can't and therefore how do I learn how not to do it in the future? And so I can see, like you're saying, there's a lot of learning, but I think a lot of learning for even the compliance people to go, all right, I need to be able to have it. Here's the context. But of course, you know, this, this context is law that is still very broad, but it just gives a framework for that to go, this is the point we need to debate now, right? This is what we're debating about. Okay, let's talk that through as opposed to just no. You know, which yes, isn't helpful correct. for anybody. Correct, correct. Mm-hmm. And and the licensees get to take some learning out of it as well. So when they, because the, the 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 fourth line, you know, the, the reports at the individual SLA level, but as the data collates and collects, the um, licensee can start to see from their dashboard the. The, any themes, any right. you know, like we've got a top ten issue, for example, as part of the as part of the dashboard. And what it allows the licensee to do is they can look at it and say, well, the, is that a SOA template issue? Do we need to change our the way our template structured? Is it a uh, is it a policy issue? Is it is it we, are we telling advisors to do things a certain way which we shouldn't be doing? Yep. Or is it uh, an individual advisor uh, challenge? And 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 do we need to maybe put some more resources and coaching into that individual advisor for whatever reason? Yeah, so absolutely. it gives them real power to kind of manage their risks internally at a, in a real time kind of scenario and make changes as as needed suited to their needs. And I mean, the difference of using it before advice becomes live, for want a better expression, um, you know, it's that difference between you know an accountant's report which is looking backwards. The problem with those things is there's nothing you can do about that. It's the year's gone, right? All correct, you can do is correct. change the next year. So to change our perspective on this and go, all right, this is what we think we're going to do. Let's run it through a system that will give us some feedback. Just lets you constantly upgrade the quality. Like I can see that being and a wonderful tool for new advisors. Like go away, write whatever you like. We're going to run it through the system, and I'm I'm betting that it'll come back like those horrible, you know, English red marked up. So like the first time they do one, it'll just be like here are all the problems, and then over time, you know, they'll learn where they need to adjust. And truthfully, that's the best way to learn. Correct. You know, is yeah, to just absolutely. revisit over and over again, keep on re- visiting, get better. You know, each time. So it's quite given how many professional year people we're going to have to try and put through this industry to meet the need to have something that sort of facilitates that that sort of feedback loop. I think is powerful. Yeah, and and that's where um, licensees are starting to use fourth line as well is in the professional year. Um, so when they're, they're in their provisional advisor status and they're they're generating their SOAs, um, so they're all being pre vetted through. Um, for fine as well. So really, it just allow again. It's a, it's about our licensees being able to utilize their resources in the most effective way because it frees up the supervisor, for example, instead of them having to you know physically check the the advice themselves against checklists and whatever. They allow they allow for fine to do that, and then the supervisor uses that output as a coaching collaboration tool, and that's what the professional is designed for. Exactly yes. that. Yes, exactly. And in fact, to date, you know, there's. There's a limit to how many tools we actually have to help the professional year. I mean, it's, mm. it's a bit bare, if you know. I mean, the bones are a bit bare because yeah. the thing's new, and and that's natural. But, but I do think this type of thing that, like you say, anything that can provide framework and and sort of context for a great discussion is so powerful. You know, that's when people learn, um, and that's when people who have been around for years learn too. You know, I mean, it's to, we we've got to stop telling ourselves that we know everything or anything that we've learned. We've potentially retained everything. It's not possible. It just simply isn't, <laughs> given the volume of information we've all got to absorb. So we've got to keep, you know, relearning. And, and, the, and the amount of changes that, that happen right? in the industry. Yeah, yeah. Like it's ludicrous. So, so you know, anything that sort of prompts that I think is really, really good. I'm sort of curious on your take then, um, you know, when the announcements came out that uh, there might be some, in the future, there might be some significant changes in terms of, say, documentation or advice documents, all sorts of things, then, you know, is that where you're seeing potentially a shift to, you know, everything leading up to that point? So, you know, the rigor of how we've documented and and put together everything that leads up to the advice documentation, because that might not quite be what it was before. Is that sort of where you guys are focusing? Yeah, it's a good good question. So, I mean, 
it's it, when I when I kind of saw some of the webinars with Michelle Levy and and read the QAR and all that kind of stuff, it was funny because I, I looked at it and thought, oh, well, we're kind of doing that already. Like, <laughs> it doesn't really matter if it if it's a forty page SOA or a two page letter out to the client or whatever, because what the fourth line system is doing is actually looking at the process that's followed up until that point. Because the SOA is just an outcome; it's just an outcome of all the things that are done preceding that before the buttons pushed and the and the documents generated um so so absolutely so um that's where i think uh the the industry may go in terms of you know moving away from uh, analyzing the soa as the focus and moving towards the the analysis of the of the process sort of which evidence we're doing essentially the of the process yeah 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 correct and and also you know moving into um other areas in the in the future like the 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 quality of advice review might um, lead to where uh, a situation where SOAs are either well, the SOAs as we know them today are, are, are a thing of the past, and it it becomes easier for letters of advice to be right. given and a couple of pages up to ten pages, depending on the the advice that's that's given and all that kind of stuff. And it may actually encourage um, you know innovation in the way that uh, advisors deliver the advice. So the process still needs to be followed, but it might actually generate some innovation around, well, do we do it like the FBA through the video kind of um, uh, process or there's a couple of players out there in the market that are, um, uh, you know, looking at digital presentation solutions. Um, so if, as, you, as your viewers probably or listeners probably know around uh, Live Prezo, they, they had that ROA solution with FYG. Uh, recently, uh, mm-hmm. and there's, um, you know, and if I hear in the woodwork there's some uh, other players in the market who uh, are looking to do a similar thing on the SOA front. So it's it's exciting times, and and but you're spot on right. It it doesn't change the process that needs to be followed to get to the end result. Whether they change the legislation, whether Section nine six one B G H and J and all those things change. That's fine. That's just the nuts and bolts. But the the process is still the same. It hasn't changed since I've been in the industry, which is you know in the mid mid nineties. Mm-hmm. The 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 details might have changed behind the scenes, but the process is still the same. You still got to engage. You still got to listen. You still got to understand. You still got to use your expertise to craft uh, advice that's suitable to the client in the best interest, whatever words you want to use. And it's that process that's in, is is important because if you follow the process. Uh, in the right way, then the end result takes care of itself. It does. And I think the other thing I've realised, and we've just, you know, realised sort of this internally, is advice or or the machinations that go on in an advisor's head, you know, when they're sort of constructing and, and, and analysing, the more you can get that better down somewhere, you know, mm. internally potentially, but somewhere such that anybody can go back to or step into or need to take over for a moment and can see exactly why you got to where you got to. They can take the next step easily. They can like the, you know, this rigor of the evidence of your thought process, which is probably something that hasn't historically been particularly as well done as the focus on the SOA, right? That was always the thing that was make sure that's got bigger, right? Whereas the rigor on the how the hell you got there (laughs) um, to me has an efficiency impact as well. Because the more rigorous that is, the more you can have somebody else stepping into elements that they can take over. The more we can have people on maternity leave or part time, the more we can have like all those things are all possible when that evidence is is really clear. Um, and that sort of lead up is something that's easy to just step into. So it's exciting to see, you know, tools like this that are starting to focus a bit more on that rather than just the advice documentation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So then, okay, so are there any practices to date, and let's focus on a sort of practice level rather than licensee level, that you find this works really well for versus others where it's a bit of a struggle to sort of use or implement the tool? Um, yeah, look, it's at the practice level, I suppose it's almost like two two levels of practice. So there's, there's a small practice where mm-hmm. you've got maybe two to five advisors in the practice um, so often, not always, but often they'll be multidisciplinary practices. So a bit of accounting, maybe a bit of mortgage broker, maybe all three. Um, and and because they're doing things really well with their clients, and they've got great systems, and they're they're optimised their internal resources in terms of technology and human capacity. 
um, they use Forthline really well in terms of pre-vetting. So, right. so that's the, that's the perfect kind of we. I see that I've seen it a lot over the last twelve months, especially um, where they'll because they're you know putting through um, you know at that level up to five ARs, um, mm-hmm. the volume of SOAs that they're generating per month. It's very economical and affordable to put it through for fine without a problem, okay. uh, yeah. and and the turnaround and and it fits into the advice process and the engagement with the client. Um, the other the other end, I suppose, is is your slightly bigger um, practices. So you know you might have you know 10, 10 plus or north of ten advisors say in the practice, uh, and what that what usually happens there is well, it's usually the practice manager or the or the um, uh, practice principal will come to us and they've just hit capacity. They're just so stretched um, that they can't, you know, the, the the person spending all their time peer reviewing SOAs before they go out the door and they're worried that, A, they're missing stuff and, B, they're not using, using their time uh, optimally. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, correct. So, so that's where um, Forthline allows them to take back their time, still have complete oversight of all of their their um, their advisors, and it also allows them to to um, risk manage their advisors at that level as well. Like some people might need a bit more hands on um, oversight, right? Um, so so they might be they might be put through Forthline a bit more than say you know maybe the principal who's been around for a long time and and they've to do the odd review through Forthline, but they're happy with the way they're going there. So, so it allows them to do that. Um, often, two um, uh, licensees and practices are still doing the what I call the traditional backward-looking post advice audits as well. They still yep. do that. That's part of their process. It's part of um, how they manage their risk and also um, uh, sometimes for reporting for PI renewals and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so it allows them. So I, I'm still amazed, to be honest with you. I'm still mm-hmm. amazed that I, I speak to a practice or a licensee, and it's like, so tell me about your compliance structure. What are you doing? Blah blah. And they'll say, oh yeah, we do. You know, two two random files per advisor per quarter over the course of the year, backward looking. And it's like, really? I mean, that's you're exposing yourself to a bit of risk there. Yeah. So 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 it allows them to kind of now we can scale that up a bit more and it allows them to get a better feel for what's going on. Um, and also, ironically, and hopefully not. In a, in a large way, it allows them to meet their breach reporting obligations and identify issues and, and you know, put them through the system too, ASIC, in, in line with what's required. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so if somebody's sort of thinking about um, becoming a client or they're curious about it, then is there anything that you consistently see that they should be doing even before? They like, you know, you probably need to just do this, you know, before you actually take on a tool like this. Is there anything you see that that either practices wish they did or or they consistently, you know, is a gap before they start using the tool? Um, I, I, look, to be honest with you, I, I don't I, I don't think so. But I think the way I'd answer that though is, um, I think what from past experience, the the one thing I would say is uh, or the advice I would give is, um, you know, say to licensees, just just make sure you've got oversight of what's going on. You know, um, make sure you're, you know, using technology as best as you can to, um, you know, inform your advisor network. You know, it's very different if they're employed advisors versus versus a network of self-employed advisors. So just and also having structure to how they manage their advisors you know have a have a strategy basically yeah have an advice management strategy um yeah. i'm still surprised about how many um don't yep. and uh, uh, but i completely understand because you know in the world of small business especially when you go from starting it from scratch and growing it and going through all the iterations you know sometimes you're just pedaling very very hard and you do things very very well but it's sometimes um you know you don't step back and kind of take that uh, higher level overview and say well what what could i do better what what can i do better yeah uh, so yeah so i i'd, I'd probably wish that just be saying um make sure you've got oversight of you you guys we've got some kind of, kind of structure in place um and um just have a think about if you if you are going to use a tool like forefine have a think about how you might want to use it once you engage with it and you know part of the onboarding process we do is we help um clients think through that that yep. what i call the four fine strategy um think through how they're going to use it and what they want to get out of it and um you know that first probably 
um, you know, three to six months of using Forthline, it's a real learning, a positive learning curve for them um, sure. because it's not just about putting files through, getting reports and ticking the box. It's about getting the reports from Forthline and then interpreting the results and actually applying it back into the licensee and the advisors. And that's yeah. and that's the key. And that first three to six months is really important. And we, we help them with that as well. So part of the service offering we, we do through Fourth Line it's, is that if a licensee has a question about a particular flag and a particular report or a, a particular theme that keeps coming up for a particular advisor, um, we talk with them through it. And so we say, well, this is this is why it's coming up. This is um, some of the issues. And they might say, well, how, do we, how can we fix that? And we'll say, well, look, um, some best practices from what we see across the industry are this or that. And so they can then work that back into the way they yeah. do things. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, um, I mean, some, one of the things I see in that sort of, it's probably that mid-sized practice, you know, so it's more than just a few. Generally with a few, there's going to be a leader, like a distinct leader in that that's probably even trained the others, you know, so there's some, yes. so in terms of consistency or methodology, it's almost subliminally passed on, you know, like it's, it's yes, sort of yes. clear there. But when they get just that next bit bigger, and you can see, you know, oh, but I don't do it that way. You know, like that'll be an expression that I'm sure from some of the advisors, and it's natural, you know, we all have ways we approach things or methodologies, even just investment methodology. But I'm betting what some of this sort of feedback comes out is it's clear you do need a methodology across the practice. This is how we approach these things. Now, I can have rigorous debate. You can yes. revisit it all the time, get all the advisors in a room, lock the doors, don't let them out till they agree. But but still, I think, you know, those across the board for lots of things, you know, those methodologies that have some considered thought behind them are the sort of thing that's going to come out of these sort of processes because you'll just see those differences. It's like, why why are they doing that so differently? Like that that doesn't make sense, you know. Correct, correct. And and the fourth line report highlights those differences and then allows the licensee at, or the practice to say, right, okay, it, here's some of the issues, here's, here's why they're issues. All right, to overcome this, this is how we're going to approach things going forward. And and you're right, like um, uh, a lot of practices will have uh, monthly or quarterly catch-ups where they'll look at um, the, the feedback from the fourth line system and say, right, okay, do we need to tweak anything? Are we on the right path? What does this mean for the way we do things? And, and so it's a real um, kind of iterative process. Yeah, perfect. And so talk to me about integration. Does it does Fourthline currently integrate with any other tools out there? Yeah, so we've got open API, so, so there's no problem okay. with um, with uh, software and, and other platforms integrating into uh, into Forthline. Um, we've got uh, we've got a, a, a client at the moment who uses the the APIs really really well. Um, so it's actually a compliance consultant in this in this particular example. So mm -hmm. so um, he's got um, clients that use obviously services and then um, uses uh, Forthline as almost like the back end to help him. Um, scale up his business yeah and yeah beautifully just you know push and pull through the apis out um so yeah absolutely no dramas whatsoever awesome um and look that expression open open api i am so pleased is starting to become more and more common uh in the industry it was always something that was seen as well that's not possible why would we ever be yeah doing that? so yeah, yeah, yeah you know it's exciting and and necessary it just needs to be, you know. Now, I'm assuming, I think I know the answer to this, but I always ask in terms of client engagement or anything like that, this is very much at the advice practice licensee level. So aside from, you know, fantabulous advice being the outcome, I'm betting there isn't any awareness or, or sort of visibility for the client of fourth line in that sense. Yeah, correct. I, yeah, I'd agree with you absolutely on that. So, um, in terms of the client experience, it's really just good. They, they, they probably won't even notice it, but they, what, they, what's happening is that over time, um, the advisor's processes should improve, um, which hopefully leads to, um, quicker turnarounds, smoother turnarounds, um, all that kind of stuff so that, over time, there'll be consistency in um, what is delivered to the client as well. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, in terms of what the client sees, no, they, they probably wouldn't know what's going no. on. No. Yeah. As most reg tech, I'm betting that's the case. <laughs> yes. so, so in terms of people currently using it, is there any of the features you feel just sort of aren't getting utilised that people are just sort of not taking advantage of that you think have value? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, within the platform, so we've got a couple of functionalities within the platform that uh, allows the licensee and the practice to tailor um, the outcomes to themselves. So one is um, uh, we allow um, 
question we allow the the, the practice or the licensee to, to almost build their own questions okay so they can they can put in their own questions that are you know policy or procedure related internally so yep. that they can ensure that every piece of advice that goes through fourth line has that wash over through it. Okay. Um, so it's not necessarily regulatory or, you know, ASIC related or anything like that. So classic example might be um, a licensee or a practice saying, um, you know, are the other fees associated with this SOA greater than $15,000? Yeah, okay. okay. And and that's just a nice simple example because of what if, it, if, it, if the answer is yes, then what that means internally with the licensee or the practice is that gets flagged by them and pushed up the chain. Okay. Uh, even if the score out of four finds are brilliant, yep. um, it's just a, an internal mechanism. So so that's that's probably something our larger licensees use a lot more, not, not our yep. smaller licensees. Um, the, other, the other kind of functions uh, within the platform that are used to a, to, to a pretty good degree but not uh, radical support is um, the report can be turned into a live rectification plan effectively. So, okay. so when the when the when the report comes out of four fine, it's it's a like any report, it's it's set, it, the information's set and it's static. Um, and and so let's say there's maybe five uh, risks that have been highlighted um, through the through the four fine system. There's these optional extras or these extra there functions there that where you can. Um, Turn it into an action plan by adding notes. Like the okay. licensee or the practice can add notes against the risk. They can uh, add notes to tell someone to do something. So, for example, if it's a power planner, they might say, and let's say it's, I don't know, um, the scoping of the advice is the yep. issue. Um, so they might say in the notes, you know, um, uh, para planner, can you please, um, you know, visit the fact file and file notes and, and look at the comment and, and, uh, and update the, um, the scoping section or something. I'm just paraphrasing. Um, so that allows the practice of the licensee to build out that report into a, a, into a live rectification plan. Um, then the para planner gets a copy of the, of the, the report. They go through, update the, the SOA, submit it back to the licensee or the practice, and then they can sign off those or cross-check those updates Perfect. against the report. And then they can literally accept the risks that have been identified. So they close off the report. Really, really powerful for pre-vetting. And that's mm. how a lot of our clients are using it is they're, they're taking the report, creating this live rectification plan, um, getting it all resolved and then signing it off through the platform. And what ends up happening is the whole history gets gets recorded there. So Fantastic. the initial report, the work that's done, and and then before it goes out to the SOA, so it's all kind of signed off, and then the SOA can go out. Fabulous. And you know, once again, just rigour. You know, it's yes. just all there and easy. Rigor and flexibility. So it's rigour yeah. and flexibility, and that's the key because every licensee and practice kind of does things differently a little bit yep. um, and everyone's got some, some, some licensees have uh, more liberal interpretations of things than other licensees, yep. for example, and the platform allows them to kind of um, cater for it the way they want to. And so if you can, if you can add your own questions, I mean, it could be something if, if you're, you know, if your practice, you're, you're focused on turnaround, you know, turnarounds have blown yep. out. We've got too many clients. Then they could just put in, you know, the date they had the client meeting where they did the fact find. And then you'll have the date for when they submitted into the fourth line. And it's like you yes. could just start watching that. Like, all right, yes. well, let's just be measuring this. And see. so, you know, it's just down to their own sort of um, imagination of what they want to Correct. watch and see things Correct. of, which is fabulous. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So talk to me about what's on the, we, we sort of vaguely touched on the development path, but what's on the, you know, up for the future? What else is there happening in fourth line going forward? Yeah. So building out the, the, the AI and the, um, natural, uh, language processing, all of that is a continual build and, um, it just evolves with, with technology in the platform. So that's where Swinburne's, um, really come into the fore with, uh, as a partner with us. Um, also looking at, obviously what's happening in the industry around the QAR. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I kind of touched on it before in, in terms of, um, you know, evolving our system to be able to cater for what advisors want to do in the future. So if, you know, video presentation of SOAs becomes the norm or if digital presentations of SOAs become the norm, we're building out to be able to cater for that. Yeah, um, okay. at, the mo at the moment, it's just not there. There's, there's people are still doing it the traditional way, but that's what's going on behind the scenes. We're, we're building out towards that. Um, we're also looking at other other verticals. So um, mortgage broking is a, is a classic 
um, mm-hmm. natural fit because it's it's a different piece of legislation, but the process and the engagement and the outcomes are very, very similar yeah. in, in so many ways. Um, so that's kind of what's on our roadmap. We're always taking feedback from our um, our clients and, and the market in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then ultimately, if we're kind of talking magic wand kind of stuff, mm-hmm. um, then the magic wand would be heading overseas into into other markets okay. and, you know, building the model out to be robust enough that it can be rolled out into the US or Canada or the UK or something like that. Fantastic. And so then in terms of the picture then of, of what I'm sort of hearing back from you, that, that first stage of development is, would that mean that some of the, when a, when, somebody's you know loaded up a document or even is creating a document they could be getting more or sort of immediate feedback as opposed to i mean there'd still be some i'm yeah, imagining yeah. that would come back in a report but some of it could be more live some of it could be more oi <laughs> wait a minute yeah. you know the ai is telling us that that may not be what you want to say there is that sort of where you're heading is that what what the work is yeah we're heading more towards that uh, what i like to call triaging almost like almost um that that immediate almost instantaneous triaging of yeah um of risk so yeah. based on a licensee's preferences and that's mm-hmm. that's the key so not us telling them uh, yeah. the way they should think but the licensee or the practice um kind of having some um key risk indicators that they can set and yep. then allow the system to kind of um flag or triage anything that might want to go on to something further uh, or just keep going through the usual full fine process anything else we've missed feel like we've covered a fair bit yeah no I, I feel like we've covered a fair bit as well I, I don't I don't think so I think um I suppose just I, I see over the last year uh, probably to 18 months um there's a lot more awareness around compliance as an advice advice enabler not not a not a kind of punitive kind of cop on the beat or, you know, it's naughty, naughty type thing. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, the breach reporting for all the, the challenges it's probably brought uh, for, for many people in the industry in the licensees and whatever, um, I've seen it have quite a positive effect on, mm-hmm. on the industry because it really has got people thinking about what's going out to um, what's going out to the client, not just is the SOA compliant, but it has, you know, has the process been followed and, and as a result yeah. is the SOA kind of, kind of compliant. Um, and there's a real positivity around the industry as well. I've got to say with the professional year and the settling down of the exam and, um, <laughs> you know, all sorts of things, um, I, I, I just sense a real kind of um, um, levelling of the industry yeah. and now everyone's ready to kind of take it to that next level and um and and as a result, you know the the feedback and the engagement we've been getting from people using fourth line has just been tremendous. That's fantastic, and I do think <clears throat> even just from your conversation and and what you guys have developed, you know, shifting the mentality from mm. admonishment, you know, at, at the end of the process to support, because that's really what it's doing. It's just support. This is this is just more input, more insight getting better, making a better outcome, like all sorts of tools we use, um, then, you know, that shift in mentality will make advisors feel different about using tools, but also just about their advice process. So I think that's really exciting um, because, you know, to be to be just constantly wondering when the, you know, audit 12 months down the track of those docs, like that's just insane, right? It just, it's just not helpful, um, let yeah. alone the fact that often things are then, you know, assessed on, a new legislation that didn't apply for that time device and you know, like all that stuff. It just got, it gets a bit ridiculous. So, you know, that shift in mentality while you're doing it, let's just make it as good as it can be. That's fantastic and really exciting. So yeah, well done for contributing to all of that. I think that's, oh, thanks, that's Peter. fabulous. Well, thank you. <laughs> all right, advice explorers. If you'd like to find out more about fourth line, then the website link is going to be in the episode show notes along with Joel's LinkedIn details yep. so feel free to absolutely yep. nudge Reach him on linkedin anytime. <laughs> so you know thank you so much for joining us joel and i You're really welcome. love this sort of contribution that fourth line is making to helping well really us build more bionic advisors you know which is which we need loads more more on in the industry so thank you now thank you for having me peter so are you or maybe your practice maybe even your licensee a current user of fourth line Actually, you could probably even ask. You may not be aware that that's what they're using and you could, hey, send that question up the line. 
if you do and are aware of using that you use fourth line, then, you know, do you agree or disagree with uh, what we covered? I'd love you to share any insights that you have into the tool on the XY community platform, as I personally would love to hear your take. And I know there'll be other advisors out there that would be curious about how that, how fourth line has gone in terms of utilizing it as part of your process, as opposed to something that's sort of external and happens down the line. Now, as for my thoughts, look, whenever we introduce a new type of tool like this, right, something that we may not have had some tech to cover before, I think we really need to double down on the recruitment approach to systems onboarding. Now, what I mean by that is, is that when we recruit a new person, we actually give them, you know, we go through a process. We might give the team a heads up, we're recruiting somebody and why and what value it'll add to them and also to the practice generally. We probably design an onboarding and training plan for the person, the new person, or we might even do a welcome lunch or some sort of warm introduction to the team. And then we check in with them regularly once they start in that early phase, maybe even as long as a year or two to make sure that they're um, making progress and they know, don't need any further import or training. Now, we need to do the same for a new type of t- system like this, something that we're, is new to the team. You're going to need to give your team a heads up on the new system and how it's going to benefit them and how it's going to benefit their clients. You know, definitely design an onboarding and training plan that gives everyone in the team all of the insights and understanding they need and then the repetition in the training to get it right and be able to use the tool well. Then absolutely put in place a structure around both the one-on-one feedback with advisors and the team learning process where you do that feedback loop so you can be constantly iterating the way you do things and the methodology you use. And then overall, you know, absolutely check in on how the tool is going specifically as a tech tool, how the team are finding it and ensure that it gets openly accepted into the practice rather than maybe rejected out of hand, which can come about when you've got a brand new type of tech that you introduce. Now, as we know, there really is only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity. And so to help you build that habit even further, Today's Curiosity Corner app that caught my eye is Grammarly. Now, you can find it at Grammarly.com and their tagline is help you compose bold, clear, mistake-free writing. Well, it sounds pretty good to me. Now, what happens is um, you can get suggestions from Grammarly while you're writing in desktop applications and even sites across the web. Now, this can be, but you can move between different apps, social media, messages, emails, documents, right? Think of this really as live proofreading. And when you think about it, it's so important we bring both clarity and heart into the way we write for our clients. Um, I think it can be really natural that we get sometimes a bit stiff and awkward in our written language. I think maybe we think it's more professional, um, maybe even more intelligent seeming, right? So it's, it's us trying to really give confidence to the client. But The truth is, you know, the most professional person is one that communicate with empathy, heart and clarity, you know, and tools like Grammarly can actually help us do this and help us really fine tune our writing skills. In fact, you know, the way we write can really make or break a concept we're trying to communicate to our clients. You know, this was never clearer to me than uh, when I read an article our amazing podcast producer, Kieran, hi, Kieran, uh, sent me, uh, right? And this article actually highlighted that Gen Z's reaction to a thumbs up emoji is that it has a rude meaning. To them, a thumbs up comes across with a passive aggressive or confrontational air. Several even claimed that they felt attacked when it gets used. Now, I was just gobsmacked. If you're an avid listener to the Advice Tech podcast, you'll know that the most popular emoji amongst our guests is the thumbs up. In fact, Joel said it was his most most used emoji as well. Now, this is presumably because it's used as a well done or an I agree sort of gesture or emoji. But what if the audience you use it with translate it into something quite different? 
Now, this is just one example for Gen Z, but I guarantee you there are similar things in either the language we use, the punctuation, the emojis, and the tone that will mean what we say will get communicated to that end audience in quite a different way than what we either planned or expected. This is one of the many reasons why we need to tailor our technology use to who we are talking to and engaging with. So therefore, on the down low, just between you and me, I'm really excited to share that I've partnered with brand marketing and avatar guru, Jenny Pierce, to bring you the Niche Down and Scale Up Masterclass. Now, this is going to be an in-person workshop where to start with, Jenny's going to take you through really narrowing down just who your ideal client is, not just from your business's perspective, but also who that client sees themselves as and therefore how you can better engage and communicate with them. And then using all of that, I will then lead you through what that means for your tech stack and your processes in the business. Now, the first workshop is going to be in very early 2023, and we're keeping the numbers small to really maximize the value you can extract from our combined insights. So if you'd like to be on the wait list, then please direct message me at LinkedIn uh, forward slash Peter MD, that's P-E-I-T-A-M-D, um, and we'll put you on that list. And, you know, we'd love to get you seeing more of your ideal clients that you really enjoy working with. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And I'll look forward to tuning up, turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. Thank <laughs> you.